All right. I thought maybe what we might uh, do first is um, I'm going to talk about some other things in a little bit. But I was wondering if someone might like to, uh, if we could maybe just start with like a Q&A. And I brought a little microphone here for anyone who'd like to come up. Uh, was that a question? Yeah. Can you, can you do it from the microphone? <laughs> um, for this Q&A, are we supposed to direct our questions towards you? Um, you know, that's a, that's a good idea. That, you, you could do that, but you could also, I mean, I'm sure you could ask other people questions, too. That was my only question. Yeah. Cool, thanks. <laughs> other questions? Um, first one's a... Silly question. Uh, is that beard real? It's, it's just, that, it's just that the color is just so different from your hair. I think, uh, I don't know, would, would you like to touch it and see? And uh, Okay. <laughs> wow, this is, what do you think? I, it doesn't feel real to me. I, I, I don't think I could ever grow a beard like that, but um, okay, I have a more... Well, and, and you don't have to. Okay. Oh, <laughs> you have I, I <laughs> kind of want to with the future goal, but um, okay, I, I have like a more serious... Uh, How's like the volume, a, by the way, on this? Is this all right? Okay. Um, this is, I haven't really, this isn't a fully formed question yet, but I was, um, I was kind of discussing in my class yesterday regarding the eternal telethon, and I was wondering like, is, is the work uh, you know, kind of referencing the kind of like background noise of like media, like kind of like C-SPAN, you know, along with like telethons and stuff, but like especially mm -hmm. I was thinking of like C-SPAN and how it's always going on and most people never seem to really know exactly what's going on if they don't intentionally like know what to look for and it's, um, and I was just wondering if Maybe you could talk a little bit more about what, what's that last part? What was the last part of that question about the not knowing what to look for? Like uh, with C-SPAN, if you just unlike like regular news channels, if you just turn to like C-SPAN, like it's it's always like in the middle of like you know uh, you know any other presentation that they usually give. It seems like you know they mm -hmm. all seem to be like that's like the same kind of I don't know. It's hard to differentiate between right. I guess what's going on at a time, so I was wondering if, that, if that's kind of what you're referencing, because I feel like when I was looking at the telethon online, it kind of had that feel to it as well. And yeah, so. well first off, uh, I'll, let me just mention that um, uh, I'm just one of many members of the telethon, so, um, so other folks would maybe answer these questions differently um, in terms of what their inspiration are or whatnot. Um, in terms of my read of it, um, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it um, and that's one of and that's definitely one of them which is just the barrage of heads that are constantly talking at us but more specifically like I think the difference between like say c-span and maybe the telethon uh, is that the telethon is maybe more like when I was driving here I was uh, listening um, to NPR and they just like were doing um, their fundraising drive today um, and it was like one of the more intense ones I've ever heard. I think they had some, someone was gonna match like $10,000 if they got in and it was like, it was like 1150 or 1259 and they still were down like five people and the guy was just, just like going really fast and he, but he wasn't just like, he wasn't, he wasn't just saying stuff, he was like appealing, he was appealing to the, to the listener and it's this, it's this like, this extremely, to me it's like that, that's a very, fa that's a fascinating voice, this like, desperate appeal, oh. you know, for action, you know, action on my part, you know. Um, yeah, and if you guys, if you remind me, we'll listen to some, uh, uh, something by Chris Burden, which is kind of an interesting kind of play, play on that. So, any, I don't know, any other questions about, well, I mean, what else do you think it is related to? Almost, well, I mean, I, I was sure just kind of fascinated the with, uh, like the background noise part of it. Like, I, I don't know if you've heard of, um, uh, you, you might have heard of this writer, Tom McCarthy. He like wrote mm -hmm. this novel called, uh, but he's like fascinated with like how uh, all this broadcasting information is constantly like around us in the world at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And it's all like channeled through TV and stuff. But I was just thinking about like that, the, uh, 
invisible kind of background noise of information that's constantly going around. And I was thinking about, I was comparing that to like physical background noise too, because right. some other like artists came in and visited and did this demonstration where we're listening to like the background noise of our art building and all the like re uh, resident like noises of the art building. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, you know, it, that kind of came to my mind as I was watching uh, this piece and online and I, know, I just thought yeah. that was kind of So there was like a hubbub going yeah. on in a, in a sense or a din of, <coughs> of sound. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if that's um, consistent with all of the telethons that have happened, but there's, it's definitely like, it's a format that, um, you know, on purpose is very like low, f well, I mean, it's, it's basically very low fi because it has to be easy and quick and, or whatever else, people will get burned out too quickly. I mean, even, even as low, low fi as it is, it's like hard to keep people, you know, getting people together just for meetings on, you know, on like a monthly right. basis or something because people are so busy. So, so when you have like that kind of low fi kind of let's just make something happen, you know, you, you know, you, it results in stuff where there's not like green rooms and there's not like refined performance spaces and, um, you know, you know, and part of, for me, um, uh, I've, we've been, the Eternal Telethon went and did some talks in uh, Pitzer last week, and one of the things that kind of came up is, for me, is just realizing how, you know, the, 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 the conceit of, or the premise of the Eternal Telethon is to satisfy certain needs of artists, and that's like that we don't really have a retirement plan ahead of us, for the most part, um, that, you know, most of us don't, you know, most of us work, but we don't have the kinds of jobs that provide us that sort of thing, and we're not saving money, and you know, uh, and so it's kind of playing with that with that conceit. But then it's also I realized in listening to other folks talk about it that you know the format itself is you know where that the language of it is talking about the future, right? It's talking about the future where artists will be able to retire from whatever they want. You know, maybe they retire from art, or maybe they just retire from everything else, so they can continue being practicing artists, but. But the, the act of the te telethon itself is satisfy is working to deal with the needs of artists now in the present by providing a platform for artists to do weird performances. And as someone, um, and you 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 guys are working with Mark, who is is someone who specifically engages in that kind of practice where it's like a present day a present day practice about you know that people that there are people who have needs for space and for support and for you know people saying yes you should do that um, and for electricity and for you know a little bit of enough shelter for you to not get rained on or whatever um, so um, so yeah the telethon definitely uh, uh, provides that support but in a very meager way and so we pop around from different environments basically almost less than spaces it's more like we move from environment to environment and those oftentimes don't have green rooms they don't have you know you know they're maybe open to the elements they may not have you know you know people are setting up right here while someone's performing there so it's definitely kind of a noisy operation long story short so certainly and and you know that ends up being like a part of it right it seems like that's what you're kind of identifying it's like a it's a texture and this is something, you know, when, when people, you know, most of you are probably pretty experienced looking at, like, performance art and video art at this point, but, you know, you, you've probably been around people who are looking at it for the first time, or any kind of experimental art, and they're always, you know, the din is what the thing, is the thing that they always notice first, right? They're like, oh, why didn't they get those people out of the room, or why are they using such a shitty camera, or why are they holding it with their hand, and what, you know? Um, so it's, so it's, partly, it's partly out of necessity, and it's partly also just this, you know, you could also say that we're kind of guilty of like a, you know, our own little fetish for messy. You know, it's kind of a, I mean, it's, punk is still here today. It just doesn't look like punk necessarily. You know, it's still kind of mess, messy and DIY. All right. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. What else? Next? Can run this like isn't the, is it the Quakers that just sit there until people talk? I hope this question doesn't come across as like not respectful because I don't oh mean it in a mean way at all. Next. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, since you were talking about like the intentional funk and messiness, is the smell of this room intentional? What does it smell like? <laughs> it must. It probably smells like me because I can't smell it. You can like go outside and 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 go in and I don't know. It's it's pretty obvious. I can smell it. I can smell it now. Yeah. What I mean, do you think it is? Yeah, the telephone was in here two days, and there's not much ventilation in here. Okay, I'm, I'm just wondering. Hope you're not offended. I'm so offended. <laughs> but, but you know, this project is kind of a, a little bit about that. This is a free speech auditorium. You're, you're welcome to <laughs> offend. Um, what's the idea with the words on the wall and the, like, the projection? Is there any... Or like, why did you choose? I don't know. Those were just kind of there here when we got here. So we just and we oh, thought they really? were nice, and we just leave them up. Yeah. But I don't know what I don't know what what what, what would you guess? Oh, Play, I don't know. Make, I'm let's confused. <laughs> um. Here, come come stand here. Um, well, I guess it's kind of a response to the things that you'd be saying, like either affirmation or negation or like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. That makes, actually that helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to take a look? What else? Um, was this um, your idea, or how did it get started? Um, this is a collaborative project um, between, well, it's between uh, sort of people who are kind of like executing kind of the master plan are myself and Tanya Rubach, who's, uh, did she visit? No, she visited the other class. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, so you met Tanya, maybe? Oh yeah, okay. I yeah. remember that. Okay. So she's a fabulous like conceptual designer and we've worked together on a bunch of other projects, which I might talk about later. And um, but then so, you know, I do a lot of my my work involves kind of creating like a certain kind of framework or a platform and then bringing like wrangling interesting artists to come and participate in that. So there's <laughs> including the telethon, which had, you know, about 10 or so artists involved, 10 to 15. There's probably a total of about 24 artists involved at differing levels. You know, some people are just doing their thing and coming in for like one day. And then we brought in Nate Page to build us this wonderful lectern. Um, uh, but in terms of like the kind of larger concept, um, uh, this act uh, a lot of this comes... Uh, I used to be involved with a space um, at to uh, not at Toastmasters at a space called Sea and Space that um, a friend of mine, Lara Bank, used to run, and it was in uh, Highland Park. And I almost I came this close to organizing an um, an event that was going to uh, or like a workshop series where that was based around public speaking or maybe panel discussions or something like that. I felt like I had kind of been to I'd just been to so many lectures and panel panels where both myself and others would walk away just being kind of like did they really just do it that way again and and you know artists like experimental artists doing um, very traditional uh, presentations and then I discovered Toastmasters um, which changed my life and um, and thought oh why don't why aren't artists doing this and why aren't we doing it together like not just taking it with the regular Toastmasters people and trying to actually use it but you know why aren't we doing like a weird weird one and so that happened many years ago of like um, as we'll see I'll show you some pictures in a little bit but I I'm, I'm very influenced by like notions of like self help and workshop culture um, which is also related to my relationship to to machine project, which is also based around kind of DIY workshop culture, and so, so this kind of comes out of that ethos of like what what happens when you give people a place to like try things out, maybe for the first time or for the second time, or what would they do this next time? 
from, et cetera. Um, can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Um, the artists that you bring, do you find that a lot of them are bringing like their own practices into their public speaking or just like experimenting and like doing something completely different? Uh, so uh, let me see if I, I understand what you're saying. So are you asking if, if when they come, are they like kind of challenging themselves through the exi through this project and doing something that they wouldn't normally do? Or are they doing something that they, is right. that what you're asking? Okay. Yeah. Um, let me think. Uh, I don't know. I think you'd have to ask them. Um, I mean, in a, it's, it's kind of a tricky question to ask because if you consider yourself like an experimentalist, yeah. then everything you do as part of your practice is like an experiment. And yeah, like I never delivered an experimental lecture until um, last Thursday when I delivered one here. And then I did it again at, I got a grant this summer and we had this mandatory retreat and I did it and I was like, oh, I have to do like an art, a 10 minute artist talk and I'm doing this project on experimental lectures. Like I can't just, like I can't just get up there and talk about experimental lectures doing a normal way. Like, and so I came up with a little structure for it. And so that was again, that was like an experiment that was within my practice. Um, but then, well, like for instance, you know, um, Johnny Jungle Guts is going to come. We're going to have a guided meditation marathon um, the last week of. November and he's really a uh, really wonderful artist he was uh, he showed up very late I don't think you guys were still here he showed up late for the telethon because he had to work but he was dressed as a, a Wonder Woman is anyone still here okay yeah do you have on purple heels I don't know oh well I saw somebody standing outside with purple heels on that might have been that might have been leopard full but oh, okay. Johnny Jungle Gus yeah I don't think he was was wearing heels okay. he's so no tall worry. already <laughs> But he, um, he has a wide ranging practice. He runs this group called Open Drawing with, I think he runs it with some others. So, he, you know, he primarily identifies as like an, you know, an artist who draws and paints, um, and then also as an animal activist. And then he has a radio show on Kei Chung. And so he does a lot of talking on there, but um, he's gonna come and do a meditation that he actually did during one of his radio shows that I heard that was amazing, but it was like that was yet another, because he had this platform of his radio show, which was happening every week, he was just trying, like, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to do something like on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis, but you get, you run out of ideas really quick or you get, you know, you get, you get like Sunday arrives and you're like, oh my gosh, I gotta do this thing and I don't even know what I'm gonna do and it forces you just to like create and create and create. And not, not all of the stuff is great, but so I think a lot of the people are, I hope that all of them are challenging themselves. I probably wouldn't ask people who are just doing stuff they've done before exactly as they have before, just because that's not as interesting to me. Maybe. But it just depends on the situation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you do stuff at K Chung Radio also? Yeah, do you? Um, no, I talk. My friend Lily does oh. Lily Rose. I know Violet her name, but I don't. Something. I'm not sure if I know Rose, her. Rose Rose Violet. Or uh -huh. something. I don't know. Um, but anyways, I was wondering if like what like what your program there is, or like what your ideas behind that program mm -hmm. is, and how they relate to this. Right. Um, well, I don't actually have a show on there. Oh. Okay. But um, oops. But my friend Guru Rugu does. Yeah, Guru Rugu has a show on there. He has the Guru Rugu has the experimental meditation hour, and um, uh, uh, folks can can just check it out. I didn't bring any. I mean, I have there are recordings online. He has a Tumblr page and. Um, that's probably the best way to find the recordings. But he does um, experimental meditations, which. Uh, who knows what that means? Like, you know, just think of a meditation, what you think of a meditation is, and then like push that aside and think what else could it be? And so um, he and I co-founded the, uh, the Experimental Meditation Center of Los Angeles, which 
Experimental Meditation Center of Los Angeles has no center, but it mostly, um, it occasionally does things out of my living room, but it can go anywhere. It's, um, uh, and the focus is, you know, it gives me like a chance to do small group work with, with uh, kind of in private with people. And then I bring in ar other artists to kind of see what their response to that kind of situation is and how they would define meditation. And, and is that what you were saying? You're, that was going to be one of the Thursdays also as an experimental meditation? Oh, or is that a separate thing? It's related to that. The, um, the Experimental Meditation Center of Los Angeles is definitely a sponsor of that, as is the, uh, the, um, the LAMGG, the Los Angeles Meditation Ghostwriters Guild, is also co-sponsoring that event. And um, yeah, we did uh, another project that I have called Signify, Sanctify, Believe. Um, was uh, as part of a larger project that we did, we had a, um, uh, we did a full day guided meditation marathon from like, I think 12.30 or one in the afternoon until about 10. And it was, we had, and it was all experimental um, uh, writers and artists who led guided meditations. So in a sense, yes, that, that like that, that line of work is very related to this project because it's like, you know, the guided meditation is a very specific thing. Um, it has uh, several very specific forms and a very specific rhetoric to it. Um, you know, it differs obviously from certain traditions to certain traditions and from country to country and whatever, but there is a lot of things that are, that, you know, are very identifiable mechanisms that are used, ranging from countdowns to like moving, um, you know, moving uh, your mind through your body and hypnotic inductions and all sorts of and visualizations. And, um, and it's a fun place for artists to kind of, I mean, that's one really fun way for artists to begin. It's like, what is a meditation? Let's take it and let's pimp it out or let's reduce it or let's stretch it or let's turn it inside out. Or on the other hand, let's just do something that's the opposite of that or has no relation to it whatsoever. Like, you know, let's have a patchouli party and call that like an experimental. That's what this room probably needs right now. I forgot my patchouli. Her, her oh, oh, that's inside here. This doesn't smell over here. Oh, you know, John Bertle was wearing the fur. Can we hear it for John Bertle wearing the fur? <laughs> Just, I saw John Bertle wearing the fur. Actually, I do have um, I do have a recording from this was from one of the very first um, uh, uh, which my columns K Chung radio things I could play just a second of it if you want to see Guru Rugu in action uh, it's not usually broadcast but at the time um, uh, I was also or he was also um, broadcasting on UStream because it was unclear K Chung radio is a pirate anyone else heard of K Chung it's a pirate radio station based in Chinatown, and the transmitter only transmits like a block or two. Um, so, uh, but and at the beginning they weren't broadcasting online as well, so it was very unclear whether any, whether you were just going to be speaking for yourself and then it would just disappear. So at first I was very untrustworthy, and so I broadcast my things on UStream as well just to make sure. But now they're broadcast online and archived. But this is like um, the first one. This was um, right after Occupy LA began. Hi, this is Guru Rugu on K Chung, AM 1630, broadcasting remotely um, in the wonderful Chinatown uh, province of Los Angeles. Um, tonight we'll be engaging in a meditation in solidarity with the General Assembly that is currently going on at Occupy LA um, at City Hall. Um, City Hall was like just out of range of the transmitter. Is everybody but ready? Walking distance from where we were broadcasting. So close your eyes. Yeah, we can all do this right now. Take a deep breath in. and out, in, and out, I'm going to breathe in, 
one more time. And when we breathe out, you're going to breathe in or out into your toes to occupy your toes. So nice to occupy my toes. Now we're going to breathe in and occupy our calves. It's so nice occupy my calves. Breathe in. And now we'll occupy our thumbs. It's so nice to occupy my thumbs. Breathe in, and now we're going to occupy our wrist chakras. It's so nice to occupy my wrist chakra.
breath in and now we're going to occupy our heels It's so nice to occupy my heels. Now, big breath, and now we're going to occupy our shoulders. It's so nice to occupy my shoulders. It's just an excerpt of Guru Rugu on Kei Chung Radio, one of many meditations that he's led, but then he also invites other artists onto the show to do things every once in a while. Um, right now, he just has a, week, a monthly show every first Sunday um, that's an hour. And um, this last one, he invited uh, a really wonderful experimental writer named Amanda Ackerman and then before that there was a wonderful experimental writer and poet named Andrew Choate and then before that there was this um, guru who was sick but had been planned to have a special guest rapper on and so he did some guided visualization-ish kind of stuff so a lot of stuff the this it's a lot of stuff having to do with language and but not only, I mean, it can go in a lot of different directions, but it ends up, I mean, especially the format is radio, so it's either language or sound or something like that, somewhere in between. So, but yes, we'll be having a guided meditation marathon on, um, is it the 29th or the 26th? Yeah, the 29th. And that will feature Unfo, which is Har Harold Abramowitz and Amanda Ackerman, plus Johnny Jungle Guts and um, Matthew Timmons. So. Any more questions? Um, what was the thing you said? It was the reverse confession or something like that? Oh, negative confessions. Negative. What, what about it? I'm just wondering what it is. Um, uh, Anna Mayer 
Anyone know Anna Mayer and her work? Yeah, how do you know Anna? Oh, right, she, because the main s person was on sabbatical or something. Awesome. Was she awesome? <laughs> See, everybody should come check her out. She's coming up a week from today. Anyone else know Anna at all? Um, how would you describe Anna? Did she ever talk about her work or anything? <laughs> mm hmm Well, just, how about just describe her as a person? It's a teacher. No, no, that's all right. I think it's I think it's fun. I teach I teach a lot, and it's you know as a teacher I'm like a public speaker. I've never taken any public speaking lessons in school, or I, I sat in on a Toastmasters once and didn't have time to join. Um, so, and I grew up being a really shy person who was a musician, a jazz drummer, you know, and I always felt tongue tied, and somehow after years and years of being really pent up, um, I somehow developed this major overcompensation, overcompensated ability just to s like stand in front of a classroom and just kind of talk about things in a way, I don't know if it's happening here, but like in my regular classes with some notes, like I can, like it's like it's, it's easy, it's like of all of the jobs I've ever had, it's like the easiest job it's still a challenge, it's not to say that easy isn't challenging, but it's like the easiest, like I'm not, I'm not like manual labor kind of guy, and I'm not very, I'm just not good at a lot of things, but I can, I can talk to people, even though I couldn't talk to people for a long time. And, um, but one thing that's always interesting is, I think when you're on the other side of like the lectern or whatever, I think we, you know, we, we watch people like, Mitt Romney and Obama and the other things and we you know we I don't know I mean on the one hand there's like the cynical view of that and that you're not seeing anything of those people but then there's a more idealistic view that you know if you learn how to speak clearly you'll be able to be heard more like people might actually have a better window into who you actually are um, but uh, I know for one that as like a teacher practicing for years you know communicating with people that you, that teachers erect, like we as teachers erect these kind of boundaries consciously and unconsciously, and then the students erect all these boundaries. And so I oftentimes feel like by the end of a semester, like I do know people in a, really well in a certain way, but I don't know who they are. And so it's just a fast, I, and I don't mean this as, it's not a critique, it's just a fascinating thing that one can spend a lot of time with other people and have a rapport, but that we kind of perform for one another. And that's something I've always been fascinated with, that we perform so differently for one another, even if we don't consider ourselves performers. And a lot of things that I think about and work with have always come out of these kind of the idiosyncrasies and awkwardnesses of everyday life. And that, that moment when you ask like the wrong question or, the, or you notice someone smell like, <laughs> like she was noticing or you know like these things you know you discover where those boundaries actually are and or someone brings up the wrong thing or uh, or someone finds a photo of you on awkward family photos in the middle of your class and starts handing their passing their their phone around the room um, you know I have a lot of friends who are like wonderful performance artists you know they have lots of naked pictures online you should definitely google your your teacher's real names because you'll find all sorts of wonderful things but um, but most of those lives are very separate from the classroom so it's a very um, we still live very private lives in public which is probably good in some ways and bad in others um, oh but Anna so Anna um, who's really wonderful in real life um, well, in the other, in another real life where I, I know her, um, it's the same thing, you know. Like, have you ever, have you ever like been best friends with someone and then you dated them and it's, 
a completely different like relationship, like or collaborated with somebody, like great friends, horrible collaborators, or vice versa. Like everybody's so so different. Um, but Anna's going to come and talk about negative confessions. Um, and I don't want to give too much away, but she's um, part of it comes out of there are these. Uh, I think it's the 42 negative confessions, and they come from the. Um, I think it's from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and they they're kind of like they're basically they read like the Ten Commandments, except there's like 42 of them, and and it's all about identity. It's about one's identity, but it's all through negation. So it's like I have not, I like it's it's these negative confessions are the thing that when you're going through the gates of whatever and the afterlife, you have to answer all these questions and you have to say, I have not done such and such. I have not done such and such. I have not. So it's all defining who you are through what you haven't done. And so, um, so she's going to do something related to that. And she just did a, she was just working with one class and she's going to. Um, uh, she, w she met with Ilana Mann's class to workshop some stuff a couple weeks ago, and she's going to meet with Bill Anthe's class this um, coming Tuesday to workshop some more stuff. And then I think some of the material that, that is generated from that will be used for the, for the event on Thursday. But other than that, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. But the next issue is dedicated to, well, not dedicated, but it's, we'll have a bunch of material from Anna in it. Weekly. We have a question. Um, so it seems like with like the negative confessions and also the guru person, there's like some like appropriation of like other cultures going on. I was just wondering You're how calling us liars. You guys engage with that. Or with other cultures? Or just like appropriating like the word guru, like the title guru or like these like Egyptian whatever yeah. they might be writings. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know it's, uh, it's interesting. There, you know, there are a couple aphorisms I could offer in the style of a guru, perhaps. Um, one might be appropriation was here before I was born. Um, uh, another might be that I prefer to make fun, I prefer not to make fun of, but to make fun with. It's a process for me that is, um, I understand it to be post-ironic in the sense that it is ironic, but the point isn't to be sarcastic, that, um, at least for me and for most of the people I work with, that um, there's, I mean, there, there's all of these um, things that have been around for a long time. As, have you guys read The Cut-Up Method by, of Brian Geisen by William Burroughs? You can find it on Ubu, The, the Cut-Up Method. It's by William Burroughs. It's called The Cut-Up Method of Brian Geisen. It's really short. You could read it in a couple minutes. And there's a couple examples in there. In the, but in the first paragraph, they say, um, this was written, I, I want to say, late 50s. Does that strike you as correct, Mark Allen? Yeah. And they say, um, now, they, you know, he instantly acknowledges that their cut-up method, which was to cut pieces of text up and put them back together in different orders and then to write it back out as if it were a single text, was not something that they invented. You know, he cites the da, you know, Tristan Tazara of, of Dada, having done that, you know, a whole generation earlier. Um, but he suggests that, you know, it's like 1950 and, like, the collage had been around for quite some time in visual arts, but collage and, um, and, and literature had not been accepted or something as like a, like a valuable form. You know, that was the rhetoric of his, of this manifesto. The cut-up method is like, the text is a manifesto, which is all about pitting 
oneself language wise against like previous orders of and he says there you know writing is 50 years behind and it's time for us to start cutting things up and collaging and this this text is situated within a book a larger book which I haven't seen the actual book because I think it's kind of hard to find called third mind and what they talked about with this idea of third mind is that when you take two sources and you cut them up and put them together to create basically a collage you make a third thing that may still retain some of the material or aura of the previous things but it is in fact a third thing so it's not a worse version of the two of them it's a third thing and it's 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 a form of like it's a you know I love the language they use around because they, they talk about it in terms of the third mind which is this you know maybe it's the psychological thing maybe it's like a spiritual like third mind like you know almost new age sound and it suggests it suggests something that is um, oh, I for, you ever have that happen where you're talking in front of people and you forget what you're talking about um, it's just a suggestion that, the, that these things are not what you think they are anymore it's a form of alchemy I feel like that's what he's talking, that's the language he's using. It's like a form of alchemy. You take two things and they create a reaction and something else is produced. So for me, that's like the post-ironic kind of landscape. One where, you know, um, yes, you can do something that someone else has done, but it's, it's different. It's really different. And we see this, this is something that comes up a lot now because now like the hot term of the last decade has been re-performance, right? And people here familiar with re-performance? Oh, you guys are a decade behind. Performance was so like 90s. That last decade was re-performance. <laughs> but re-performance, I mean, from what I, from the way that I gather, is not just about perform, like, okay, so I come from the world of music and experimental music, and when you perform a work that was written down, you're not necessarily re-performing it because you're doing an, interp an interpretation of it, and oftentimes your interpretation of it isn't being viewed by the audience the same way that they were viewing the original version of it. Okay, so it's just a performance of it. It's just an iteration of it. It was meant to be performed multiple times. But on the other hand, re-performance comes from this realm of very, well, I mean, I'm getting into dangerous territory here, but, but because reperformance does exist in music, but in the realm of art, where authorship is still so extremely strong in terms of performance, in terms of who's, who a certain performance belongs to, um, and this sense of that, you know, you do something once and then we move on and we evolve to newer pieces, um, that when people reperform things like, or when people perform like a Marina Abramovich piece, it's like a, they consider it like oftentimes considered a re-performance because you're, it's like it has, it's bringing along, the, that piece is bringing along with it generally so much baggage with it that the current version of it is grappling or using some of that previous baggage of the original of whatever and there's, and it's, it, you're kind of bringing into view um, a counterpoint between how it was performed today and how it was performed then. At least that's how I feel like reperformance is being used. It's it's a form of like his, it feels very historical. It feels very research driven. Feels very much like we're you know I'm going to put this here for you to look at. This is the original. Now I'm going to do my version of it, or I'm going to try as hard as I can, or it's really reference you know, or that that uh, previous work exists as a ghost or spirit on the stage sitting next to it. Whereas regular performance, performance without the re, seems to be more like it's self-contained. You know, you could do more. You could do more research about the work if you want, as the viewer, um, or as the performer. But it doesn't. It doesn't always happen, or it's not always the maybe the point of the work of the performance of it. Um, so, so we're in a very like re 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 sort of period because we're so drenched in you know this is also the decade of YouTube um, it's very easy to document things it's very easy to find documentation of things it's also the decade of Wikipedia like it's all like it's like that I beg to differ that you know that these things that guru does not belong to like another culture I like I disagree because I think guru belongs to 
um, Wikipedia. Uh, it's a description, and there's a description of words written in English of what it is. There's, um, there, are, there are gurus throughout Los Angeles that you can study with. So there's basically a whole, there's a, there's a whole century of American New Age culture based around imported language or imported forms that have been named and whatnot. So it's, um, uh, and so that's fascinating. And, and so I feel like for me, um, this, this definitely comes up on occasion, you know, well, like I, th I feel like what you're, what you're kind of pointing out is when one appropriates, you know, is there any sensitivity that we owe to the source of it? Or, you know, is there a boundary that's being crossed? In appropriating a form or taking, like, is it is it stealing? You know, are we going to obey that 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 notion of appropriation of like taking something? But from in my post ironic standpoint, I was given these things, and so I feel like they're mine to use because they've like I can't like I don't know if there's anybody who's gone through their American life without knowing what a guru is or in a in a certain kind of sense of what one is not and that might not have anything to do with the, what the real guru is actually like so i feel like a lot of my relationship language wise is actually to related to american culture that has appropriated so i appropriate those who have appropriated not always but you know we're we're just a bunch of repeaters i think But that's a great question. I like to think, I think about that stuff all the time. So our class came on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And I also looked at the Facebook group beforehand to try to figure out what it was all about. And I still left kind of confused about what actually happened. On Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I understand what was happening. But I didn't really understand why it was happening and what was trying to be done by doing it. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of this project seems to be providing a space that anyone has access to, to speak whatever they want, and mm -hmm. to come and listen to anything. And yet, the, just because it's such a quirky idea and unusual space to do this, I feel like it's almost not very approachable by mm -hmm. people, especially non-artists. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you've run into this problem of kind of creating an exclusive space when you're trying not to create an exclusive mm -hmm. space and how yeah. like in trying to be a very ex accessible space, it's actually kind of yeah. inaccessible. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. No, that's an excellent question and statement. Um, first, uh, I don't believe in binaries of accessible or inaccessible because it, this place is accessible to many and inaccessible to many. Um, and so, so I reject that notion of it being off or on. And so far, so far there have been many people who I haven't, like, who are not a part of my community, who I haven't ever met before, uh, who are weird, <laughs> weirder than I would invite. Um, uh, who have shown up and done things. And so in that regard, uh, I feel like for me, like, I, I mean, I guess I do believe in those a little bit because they're, it's, def it's a spectrum, right? And within that spectrum, like, I, you know, I, I do a lot of work just with my community, partly because my community has needs that I feel like are unmet. And that, you know, uh, like, yes, we're artists. Yes, some of us are, yes, we are all privileged in many ways, but we're also like, like very desperate in other ways and we have needs. So um, for me it's important to do things with my community. Um, this obviously is like a, like a different situation, although at the same time like I have like, you know, uh, I know Mark, I know like Pitzer, and I went to school with Pitzer T. Like, so my community also is here too. It's like close enough to home to feel kind of homey, but then it's situated in this space. So well, what do you do with that? You know, what, what do I do with this opportunity? Um, yes, I think some people are going to be turned off and maybe not want to participate. Um, but that's just something I'm willing to accept. Like, I, like I, don't, 
I don't think this is a space for everyone, and I don't think everyone's going to feel comfortable here, and I don't think everything that needs to be said can or will be, or even should be said here. Um, instead, what we've done is we've created a little bit of a frame, just a framework for um, to provoke certain kinds of responses, and you know, to me, like to me, just having a just having a soapbox is just not, not interesting to me. Like if it were just, like they, the museum could have just put a lectern in here and just said that the room is open and anybody can come and speak. Um, and that would, have been, that would have been fine, but that would be an, that's just a different artwork than, or I mean I shouldn't even say the museum could, like another artist could do that. And that would be a fine artwork, but it's different. And so I think the thing to, you know, this is a thing that kind of come, like that, you know, I've had to kind of grapple with this you know, in terms of, you know, negotiating even with the museum as to, you know, like, you know, worrying about what kinds of things we put on our publications, like are we going to edit or censor ourselves so that we don't turn off a whole part of the community, or are we going to just, like, be artists and say what we want, or, you know, like, like or, or are we going to do a, you know, if we just say what we want, are we going to do these events and nobody shows up, like, and how much is that us, or is that because, like, people are busy, or, you know, so, in weighing all those things, the things I just keep coming back is to is that I'm not a, I'm not a social worker. I'm an artist. I'm I'm like we are we are work, the artists and I are working together to create an exhibit. And you know, some people walk into the cage room over there and have no experience, and some people have some experience. Um, and so I think this I think this project works on the same levels. Now that said, the project is very much about rhetoric. Right, it has this rhetoric, which is about, come on, everybody, um, and so uh, uh, it has that enticing kind of like the, you know that kind of rhetoric, but um, of that this space is for everyone, and that's something that we're definitely playing with. But but if you but one thing you know, especially if you start looking at the publications, the way one kind of clue into how we conceptualized the publications was that. You know, we were making, the, we realized we want to make these newspapers who are like, but who does newspapers anymore? Newspapers are dead, basically, or almost dead. They're dying. If they're not dead, they're dying, right? In terms of mass media, you know, everything's online. And so we kind of conceptualized our publications as being these like very kind of desperate like entities with each issue with a different identity, but all that's all slightly desperate trying to like, you know, reach out to, to folks. Um, and so I don't know. So we've been so for for me, we're really just playing with with a lot of different things, you know. And but I do I do think there is room for participation in it. Like I don't think it's shutting folks out. I mean, um, there are plenty of things. Yeah, I mean, uh, even with a with a blank slate room, uh, all you need is like for and just a mic. All you need is one person to come in to ruin the vibe, and everybody leaves. So. Um, the people who participate are, you know, have just as much a um, uh, uh, potential affect on what ends up happening afterwards. So. Yeah, and that was also just kind of a general question about oh, yeah. a lot of these experimental art spaces that are happening now, even like Machine Project, mm -hmm. the same kind of thing. So. Oh, wait, wait uh, say that again, but explain, explain that a little bit. Oh, it's, well, the same kind of dynamic, I think, is happening, or happens in a lot of these different experimental art spaces. Mm -hmm. um, in just going to some of the events or things that happen in those places, you realize that it's all kind of the same community there, mm -hmm. when it feels like those spaces were made to draw in, like, everybody and anybody. But that's just from my observations. And are you part of the communities that are there? I don't know. Well, so that well, so <laughs> I would be careful about that because I would just be careful to judge the community from the outside. Because I've I've witnessed other people do something similar where they showed up to a show. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I had some students come to. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to make this about students because it's not about students. It's just about being yeah. an outsider entering a new space where people look the same. Yeah. Or they look like they're all part of the same community. And I had a student come to a show of a friend of mine, and then we were both there. And the show was, was good, but it was, and it was a lot of, it was a dance, like chore experimental choreography. Mm -hmm. and, 
and then there was a lot of sharing afterwards in this conversation and stuff and um, it was actually I thought I was a really like positive environment and the person who came was just like oh, all those people just already know each other they're like you know nobody said anything to me or you know felt, felt, felt like an outsider or whatever and I don't know like again like I'm a I'm a student of like of like social anxiety basically and people don't talk to each other not because they are elitist but because they're like uncomfortable and they're not good and 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 yes most of the people at a lot of places you've probably been sent are probably mostly white and probably mostly college students or college educated or maybe even MFA so yes there is like a sp specific set but I don't know. I, I think it's, it, you just have to dig a little bit deeper because I, a machine project especially, there are people coming in, like uh, I've been involved with machine project since it started, off and on, and when I go to machine project, I've had, uh, to be honest, I've had a major experiences going to machine project where I go, and I feel like, wow, where is my community? There's not a single person here that I know, even though I've been involved here. You know, yeah. and so it's a weird, it's a weird like alienating feeling where you're like, oh my gosh, did I miss the boat? Did everybody like, did like, did they go somewhere else? And that's a really awkward feeling to to have. And you realize there's so much. I mean, there's so much to experience, like so much of like a of a you know, of like art experience is not just like the art like in a vacuum. It's like the environment that it's in or the environment that you're connecting with. Um, whether you're gonna have like someone to flirt with while you're there, or is it, like are you gonna have like a really great conversation while looking at it or being around it? For me, like art is just one big excuse to bring people together, and there's always gonna be like some friction and anxiety. Yeah, and, yeah, and I didn't mean to sound like I was judging but, everyone when I went to those spaces either. Yeah. I'm sorry if it made it sound like no, I was no, that's okay. I, thinking you were doing. I guess I was just more curious about these things because it seems like a lot of them are word of mouth, and because they are un unusual. Yeah. It takes explaining and someone yeah. else kind of understanding to pull you in sometimes. Yeah, totally. Well, all the work I do is generally pretty confusing, and like there's so many elements that I get confused or forget. So, but I, I'm all right with that. I'm, yeah. So, but that's a, a, all great questions. What else? So on the topic of, well, like this space and then also like Machine Project and um, I'm just, as like inviting artists to participate here, um, I'm just wondering about like what, and, and like thinking about authorship and that type of, uh, like how uh, the performances how you see them functioning in terms of uh, like standalone performances, like you're videotaping them, so are those then like individual or how much of it gets kind of swallowed by the like say Eternal Telethon or the best, you know, podium, um, but does that make sense? I think so, uh, maybe it's just say it one more time, but. Just like uh, w when you're inviting <laughs> artists to collaborate, uh, what is the emphasis, what is the dynamic in terms of being a part of a larger uh, art piece? Like, are, is it in, are these pieces in relation, you know, like, right. how connected are they, basically? And um, well, I feel like I, um, in my work, I do a lot of organizing. I'm an artist who organizes. <laughs> And a lot of that organizing involves creating a platform or framework or whatever you want to call it that kind of contextualizes a certain kind, you know, certain other artists. And, you know, I think at the most general level, most of, most of us are probably, uh, I assume everybody here is a practicing artist who has probably participated in some kind of group show where it's like, like the holiday show or the you know the um, nature show or the you know some kind of themed show has everybody participated in something like that <laughs> a lot it's it's pretty common though right and so in a sense I don't feel like this is too like the things I do are too different from that 
And I do know some artists who are very disinterested in participating in themed shows, but some of those artists are just don't want to participate in anything. Like one one person I'm, I know, and and so you know the thing to realize is I'm not um, I'm not very I'm not very like well known or powerful or anything yet or whatever. So when people do things with me, I hope that they're usually doing it not for I mean they they might be doing it for resume builders or something. Or, but for the most part, I feel like in my community, we do things because we like the people we're working with. And so, you know, which is something that I learned from Dale Carnegie, which has some books in here, you know, you know, just to be genuinely interested in other people. And, you know, it's like a golden rule and people, you know. Um, and so our community is, uh, it's, there's not much money going around within my community. And the money that, and so what is going around though is this kind of exchange of like, it's it's a kind of like favors, but it's more like we're just like interested in what e each other are doing. And then some of us happen to be putting things together. You know, there are curators who put on group shows, and then there are people like me and Mark and others who put like create these kind of frameworks. And then we invite people, and people have a choice to say yes or no. Um, and but. I definitely, you know, there are a lot of pitfalls in that kind of practice, you know. So on the one hand, it seems on the outside, well, you know, I'm just creating a platform. It's just a show. They're just responding to a theme. But then, um, you know, occasionally something happens. Like, for instance, gosh, I don't even know if I should talk about this yet. Maybe this is something I should talk about after. But, well, the museum, uh, I'll just say it. Um, the, the museum originally, we had done, we had a press release written this summer for this. And the museum at the last, um, I, I was writing to say, hey, I think we need to send out a press release for this show. Uh, what, we're, what, what we're gonna do for that, I have this text. And they were like, oh, we're sending one out tomorrow. Here it is. And I had almost no text from the thing that we've been going on for the entire summer. And instead, it had s like five or six paragraphs that all began with the words, Adam Overton. Um, and I saw, uh, I saw like my, what you, I, I hate this word career, but I saw like my relationships with my friends, which is basically my career, um, uh, explode, like imploding. Um, because I actually had a moment like that in, um, uh, in 2001 that was really devastating. Um, <laughs> that even thinking of it kind of makes me want to cry, where I had been, my very first really big organizing thing had been with this group of people called the Electric Arts Alliance of Atlanta. And we started this thing, and it was like a monthly series and involved workshops and performances of basically artists, mostly musicians, but some artists working with electronics and computers and sound and stuff. And we were doing stuff, and then we put on this uh, festival one month where it was stuff you know, and um, and uh, the press came, you know, a knock, and they were, uh, you know, in Atlanta, great city, pretty easy to like if you're doing something different to get take some, get some notice. And um, I was young and naive, and you know, you just assume like if someone's writing a story about the this organization that they know that it's an organization and that they're going to interview a lot of other people. And from what I remember, they or like they interviewed me. You know, they had contact info for the other folks, and then lo and behold, uh, the article shows up, and there's a picture of me on the cover, and it makes it basically sound like it's my organization. Um, and it basically ended, like it ended really tragically. Um, and so we had like this near miss here, where it was like, you know, I've got like, Like what you're talking about is like a huge issue in my community because there's not very much money and like people that I've invited are mostly making around like $300 for their work. That's like what I've arranged through this budget, um, considering the circumstances. And but even it, you know, most most of the time we're doing stuff for free or for cheap, um, and we put in we put in a lot of work. And then when someone when when either someone gets noticed on purpose, like their ego just gets too big, or not on purpose because the press keeps saying that it's your project and you are the whatever, um, 
uh, that really stresses out the community like in huge ways and people take it really wrong um, and, uh, and it can be really disastrous. Um, so it's something that I'm like highly aware of and I try really, really hard to make sure that I'm, you know, that's what I, after school, after grad school, I was doing all this body-based stuff and I went to school, to st I went back to study massage for 10 weeks. I mean, it continued after that, but for 10 weeks. And the main thing you learn as a body worker is how to create like a safe space for others. And you know what, if you're like organizing people, that's also a skill that you learn is how do I make a safe space for others where people feel like they're being heard, where their work is being seen in the light that they'd like it to be seen. Um, but then there are all these other services, like, you know, like I'd like to get people to come out to see their work. Like, uh, you know, yeah, they can perform for the camera, but I'd like for actual, you know, Claremont community members to be there so that they feel like they didn't just drive out here for nothing and that they're boring artists. Um, so, so my work, I don't know. I feel like my work as an organizer has a lot to do with empathy and just trying to predict how other people tick and what their needs are. I don't have much in the way of like technical resources. Like I can't help people with that because I don't have equipment. Like, you know, we have some stuff here now, but this isn't unusual. This is an anomaly. Um, so a lot of it is reading people and figuring out like what does this person need. Um, and you know, most of these public speaking self-help books are about that too. That's Dale Carnegie. Has anybody read? Has anyone hit rock bottom like me and read How to Win Friends and Influence People? Anyone? Yeah? Did it help you? Um, I, I, I read it. Yeah. Uh, Ezra, Ezra came in and was reading from it the other night on, during Diction for Dollars. Have you seen this? And he read it in this amazingly inflected voice that made it sound like, like a, I don't know, like William Carlos Williams or something. Like it was just so beautiful. But it was just these anecdotes from Dale Carnegie. Yeah, you guys should check it out. It's an interesting book. It's, um, I remember I hit rock bottom like in 10th grade or something. <laughs> Maybe it was ninth grade, and I remember my dad had this book that he had never read, but his father swore by it. And, it's, and it had the worst title, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I was like, I remember seeing it before and being like, I will never read that book. That's the most depressing book title I've ever heard. <laughs> and then I hit rock bottom, and I was like, I'll just give it a shot. Um, Mind you, after, you know, so I read that, and then, you know, mind you, after this, I was also, like, watching PBS specials on Deepak Chopra, you know, and, like, you know, this was the beginning of my self-help, like, you know, how do I get, make it through, you know, high school with all of this angst, and so, but he has all these tips, it's all about how do you get people to work with you and for you, and it's strat strategy, the thing is, he presents it in a way that is, I, like, I like the language he uses for it, because, um, he talks a lot about just being genuine with people. You know, just, you know, he talks about how to be a good conversationalist is basically being a really good listener who actually is interested in what the other person is saying. Um, it's not just listening or feigning interest, it's like being interested. And that seems really positive, right? Like, can you, can you, you know, can you, could you have a conversation with everyone in this room or, you know, or the next person you see and just really be interested. I mean, I have to try that. I, like, I have trouble doing that with, like, my parents and, like, other, like, people I know really well. It's just like, oh, they're just, like, going to say the same thing. Like, but I know Dale Carnegie would be, like, able to get in there, you know, probably with his folks and, um, but so, the, but the funny, but the, but then the, the rub, though, is that the book is, while it's mass, it's a mass publication. It's really specifically geared towards male businessmen. Um, if you read closely, it's specifically for male businessmen. And so then it's like, oh, so it has a little more sinister quality to it all of a sudden. This is, this is not just about like being someone's friend. It's being some fr someone's friend in order to maybe you know, help oneself or whatever. So, but, but I guess that's why that whole world's called self-help. <laughs> You know, help yourself. Um.
But anyways, I think there are things that are, are useful, and I think part of what this project for me is, is and this, these realms of stuff is that these are the skills that everyone else knows. Anyone who is in power, uh, who has power and influence, um, knows how to speak in public. Um, and they probably also have negotiation skills that they learned somewhere. Um, uh, and artists um, don't necessarily have these skills unless they learn them from their parents or they took a special class or whatnot. We're not, we're not offered these sorts of things. And if you go and try and take a lot of certain, you know, Toastmasters is an anomaly. I mean, it costs some money. It's like, I think it's 40 bucks a month or 40 mo bucks a quarter or something like that. But if you want to, you know, I took a mediation class once and it was full of, um, Lawyers, and it cost it probably costs like four or five hundred dollars for like four sessions. Maybe it was more. It might have been like seven or eight hundred dollars. You know, lawyers can afford that sort of stuff. You know, but I, you know, I can't afford that stuff. I mean, I made myself afford it just because I knew I wanted to do it. But um, so those sorts of like professional, quote unquote, professional development things aren't available to us. And if you look, and this will be the second time in two weeks that I'm going to pan this organization. But there's an organization in Los Angeles that I think is complete bullshit that's called the CCI. And it's throughout California. It's not the CCF, which gave me a lot of money, and I like them a lot. But the CCI. And all they offer are professional development classes for artists that are basically about how to build your resume, how to businessify your practice, and it's just about, it's only related to business. And I think it's so narrow, and it's so ridiculously narrow, um, and unrealistic. Um, I don't know which artists they're talking to, um, because my art, my community is not making businesses or interested in that right now. Some of them are, but, you know, what my community needs are, um, we need to be able to speak up when we need to. We have. Uh, as you get older, um, you have more friends who are dying, and it's like, who's gonna like stand up and speak, you know, like at their funeral? Like that's an important thing. I went to a Toastmasters, and I was talking to people there. It's funny. Toastmasters is funny because like you go, and not only everything is so simulated there that not only are people practicing their speeches, but in the beginning they're like walking up to you and like shaking hands and trying to introduce themselves. And there's, you, you can tell they're like about to fall over. And they're so nervous and they're practicing their get to know you talk. But I asked one person, this guy who walked up who was especially nervous while he was there, and he said, oh, I have a big family um, and there are a lot of funerals and I want to be able to stand up and say something poignant when stuff like that happens. And you know, at the time it was like shocking and then also kind of funny, like, oh, but now like it's happening. And it's like, you know, I look around like at these things and, you know, we don't have the skills to do like the most basic, what seems like the most basic things. Um, we're not going to city council meetings. Um, uh, we don't, you know, there's massive conflict, you know, between people. They're, you know, there are relationships, like artists have relationships together and they break up and then they can't go to show, like I can't go to that show because this person is gonna be there. Like there's no conflict resolution going on. Um, uh, there's no negotiation going on. We're like, there's no, we're not unionized. So nobody knows what the fuck we should be making if we're gonna work with an institution that's complete guess. It's complete and total guess. Like, oh, is it is a hundred dollars or two hundred or a thousand? Like, you have no idea what to ask for. We have no, like, baseline. We have no negotiation skills. So, yeah, I don't know. So for me, um, but the, all those skills, everybody else who has power has those skills and are using them against us. I mean, I'm not trying to sound like conspiratorial. And yes, we should take a bathroom break. Oh, what are you gonna say? Oh, okay. So, I, 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 can I ask you like a difficult question? Do it. So, and I just, I know you really well and I feel comfortable doing this, but yeah. I feel like at the core of like being an effective communicator and what you're talking about is a kind of empathy, 
and understanding of the audience's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of my critiques or criticisms or just observations about um, the telethon in specific and a lot of this in general is that unless you know the people, mm -hmm. it's really boring. And I feel like one of the things, my, my perceptions of the telethon is that I enjoy kind of the spectacle of it and I enjoy kind of logging in because I can see people doing stuff. But it always seems like willfully disposing of the question of like, am I trying to make something that's like compelling to an audience? Right. And I guess the question I would have is the rhetoric around this show is sort of the model of trying to help people become better sp public speakers mm -hmm. and then kind of intervening in that. But it seems more like it's bringing that up as a topic, but that not really engaging in it. I mean, just mm -hmm. even this model of a very long Q and A, mm -hmm. it's like not really going anywhere. Like, I, I mean, it's interesting. I disagree with that. I'm getting some interesting things out of it, but I wondered if that question of whether you're really engaging in, if you believe that rhetoric is power, how are you trying to help people connect more to their right. audiences. Yeah, well, okay, so there are a couple things in there. Um, well, first off, I think like experimental, one thing that experimentalism traditionally has done is confounded the notion of what is useful and what is efficient and whether we're getting something done or not. Um, so um, I still feel like I am, and this is a part of that tradition of like, suggesting that there are other ways to get things done that don't look like things are getting done. Um, uh, so we often find that through techniques like absurdity, boredom, et cetera, or at least maybe sometimes that's how they appear on the other side. Um, in terms of whether this space is going to allow that or not, I, I don't like uh, you know a chance for people to engage. Um, again, I don't think it's like a yes or no proposition um, you know I have issues with you know uh, I feel like the space is is welcoming like I feel like it's a welcoming space it's a welcoming enough space that a you know an electern itself is not necessarily a welcoming space um, but I don't know with the like well if we took at the telethon, um, and those kinds of performances. Again, like, I feel like when I, you know, if someone were to say, like, that wasn't very interesting to me because I didn't know the people there, um, I would say that I feel like, I don't know, just part of me feels like there's a belief that art is for I don't know, either more for the audience than the artist or the same or equally for the artist and the audience. And I feel like a lot of artists who I work with, we do things because we're working through stuff. And some people are better at making that then actually connect with an audience than others. Um, Yeah, I, d I think that's just a big thing. Like, I feel like I don't like to rule out what someone has done because people at the place didn't like it. Um, that said, like, I'm not necessarily interested in stuff that just is over and over again, like, you know, trying to get people to go away. Um, I mean, I think, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think of course, the, like the telethon in terms of thinking about it as something, as a space for the artists, mm -hmm. I think that comes across and I think that yeah. functions well. Right. It's more like in the context of like if the premise of this show is really to engage the Are power and efficacy of speech. Are you talking about Besh now? Besh, okay. yeah. Um, what tra does that make? How does the telephone fit into that? Well, or? how does the, how does it engage with that other than saying that speech is powerful? 
Does oh. it attempt to make some kind of oh, yeah. well, transformative process for the people participating in it, other than kind of creating a framework for it to happen? And that's where the question about was the telethon, what is the, what is the effect of BEST on the telethon? Does it attempt mm -hmm. to transform the efficacy of the telethon oh. towards it as a speaking agent? Or is it just creating another space for the telethon to happen in? And is that applied towards the best show so many, in general? So many in, things in there. Um, well, one, the telethon was the telethon. So I think what people got was the telethon. I like the sitting down with the cure and then doing it like this. I think what people got was the telethon. They got the eternal telethon. Like, I don't feel it was, I feel like it was an odd, an odd you know, it was an odd space, um, but, um, I mean, I'll have to talk to the other folks, but that I think the other folks who were involved seemed to enjoy it. Um, they seemed to feel like it was connected to the practice of being in the telethon and doing stuff. Um, artists, the artists who came and did things um, seemed to be uh, thankful, like happy with what they had done and thankful for the chance to do, to do something on election day in this environment. Um, uh, there were people who um, seemed to enjoy the atmosphere uh, and like the framing of their work within this. Um, so, so there's that. And then in terms of like the larger best thing, like you know, obviously, like I could do this talk, like we could do this talk like tomorrow, and maybe I just focus on another, like a whole other aspect of the project. Um, so. You know, that's, you know, we only have like a certain amount of time and I can only like say one thing at a time, but so I'm focusing on like this rhetoric and power thing, but just because it's something that's like fascinating to me. I think the work is bigger than that. Like, I think it's like, I think there's more in it and I don't feel like it's like, like rhetoric power thing is completely overshadowing what other people do in here. Um, uh, But I feel like for, for me, the way that like the events that are happening, like I feel like the way that like the publication functions, the way that the artists who come in and do things function is, provi is uh, providing um, uh, different ways to think about public speaking. Um, and, I've, and I've gotten a bunch of wonderful artists involved who all have really different takes on what that might look like. And for me, that's, that is, you know, I feel like that is like the potentially liberating, I don't know if we want to even use that kind of rhetoric, but the kind of like expansive practice of art is that one might present something in a way that, um, sh that someone else might view and they realize, oh, I didn't realize you could do it that way. And like Cage, for instance, um, I was talking to, well, who was I talking to? I feel like as someone who was a part of the Fluxus community or something. And, you know, Cage in the 50s was involved with, he was teach, he taught a class and a bunch of Fluxus folks were in it. And one could argue that all of the Fluxus folks who were involved with that might have gone on to do all of the same stuff that they did in the 60s had they not taken that class. But, but what this person suggested is that, you know, Cage didn't necessarily serve as like a teacher for them. He served as like a, this kind of gate, like this gateway, this person who was a role model who was like, oh, you know, you didn't have to like, like music doesn't have to look the way that you think it does. Like it, it can look like different. Like music has, like music might be, like the music might be silent. You might not hear anything or you might only hear someone click, you know, clipping their, their pen or something, which you can keep doing, I'm not pointing out. But, and, you see like a, a huge beginning to like the realm of like inter, like this intermedia kind of practice where artists started making sounds and composers started making a f fine art or assemblage or whatever. Um, because I, I, I th and I, I think it comes out of this notion of like someone showed us that you didn't have to, like we didn't have to, like there were other ways to do this and other ways to think about it. So I feel like the project, while there may be certain aspects of it that are overshadowing the general tone of it, but I feel like there are, uh, I feel like those aspects are um, 
designed to uh, suggest that there are other ways to do things. And, you know, maybe people want to just come in and do like a, you know, spoken word or something in here, the way that they do it like down the street. But um, I think this place is, has a number of constraints and, um, and artists use constraints all the time to get themselves out of certain kinds of mindsets or out of certain <coughs> kinds of habits or and into other kinds of ways of um, negotiating space, time, uh, one's relationship to self and other. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering, I feel like maybe I'm answering my own question now and not yours anymore, but I don't know if that's related. I don't know, was that related at all? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the question of like how do you balance um, I like that. <laughs> this is how it works in classes. Like, I, I think the question of how do you balance as an artist constructing a space for your own practice and then thinking about how empathetic are you able to understand its reception. Right. And I think that, that we differ a little bit strategically and that I tend to focus projects more on the audience. Even though I feel mm -hmm. like I'm very artist focused, mm -hmm. I also feel like I uh, have a hard time, I tend to gravitate towards artists who focus a bit more on the, art, the audience's experience maybe. Yeah, well. But the other but I question I wanna ask is, do you wanna, you just wanna do Q&A the whole time? No. Well, we only have 18 minutes left. Okay, well, I just wanna say, I don't, like again, I just don't think it's like a either or sort of thing. Like I think there are some people who do work more gracefully with audiences than others, um, or maybe quote, more quote unquote empathetically with audiences than others. But um, I don't think, um, one, like we're dealing with public speech and nobody is comfortable. Most people are not comfortable with public speaking. And, um, and a lot of people are not comfortable with art. Um, I don't think it's, uh, like I think I can challenge people without being like seen as being an unempathetic artist or someone who doesn't think about the situation of the audience. In fact, I feel like most of what I do is think about how people will receive the work. But, um, but, but one of my primary fascinations with public speaking is it makes people uncomfortable. And talking about religion and meditation and my artist community makes people in my community uncomfortable. And for me, those are areas worth, um, those are areas that are worth exploring. And in exploring them, it doesn't necessarily mean making everybody comfortable in order to explore them, but exploring certain avenues of, of all of that. And so, but I would say that you know my practice is an experimental practice and I'm experimenting here along with my collaborators on this in ways that I feel like are trying to connect with people in odd and interesting ways. And it, but it may not work for everybody. But I'm not sure if it's really about working or not working. Yeah, I agree. I, and maybe my question that I was trying to get to and I don't know if I'll get to it is that um, built into the structure of something like Toastmasters is this goal of increasing one's efficacy at communicating. Right. And that my question that maybe was around, does this have not the same goal, but is there that goal of trying to be transformative in some way, right. other than creating an opportunity for someone to speak? If you look at something like Toastmasters, there's all these weird systems and feedback loops and processes and whether that was something that was built yeah. into this show or not in some way. Yeah. And so maybe that's where it's going, but we can talk about that more later too. Well, and we have what, until four? Yeah. Is that right? Well, I mean, that's a good segue into Toastmasters. So, I mean, one thing that's worth noting is that this project is not a Toastmasters. It's not like a faux Toastmasters because Toastmasters is highly structured. And so this is not a Toastmasters, this is just an open, like a project that involves like an open mic and a series of events. 
And Toastmasters is just one of many like influences that this project is uh, coming from. And so in terms of my practice, like a lot of it is geared towards these kind of self-help modalities that, pro that make these proclamations that one will grow through this. And I feel like you know, going to school for music and then for art or, or a performance and art was also a self-help you know, program that I went through. You guys are doing it. Um, and there's promises that are made at the beginning, some of which are kept and others that aren't and then all sorts of other things that happen that you didn't expect, um, that were never even mentioned, both positive and negative. Um, and so, no, I'm not really sure if there's like an actual, like, like what will people, like, like people will get X out of Besht sort of thing. Um, but it definitely plays with those, the, you know, um, those forms, and I feel like there is something valuable to playing with forms, and it's some kind of uncanny attraction that I have. And most of the artists that I'm really interested in are drawn to with a weird fascination with forms um, and social forms. So, uh, but yeah, so I still don't know if I'm answering completely what you're asking. But. It's um, so one thing that I was hoping to maybe do with you guys, if you guys are up for it, is on Thursday, November 29th, Mark is going to be gone, and I would like to run a artist-run Toastmasters with you guys. Um, let me just skip ahead to a little bit. Oops. <laughs> Oops. I went to a Toastmasters. I think no, nobody had been there before, right? Nobody's been to a Toastmasters. You can find um, them all over Los Angeles, almost any day of the week, almost any time of the day. There are groups that don't know each other. They just come kind of like AA or something. You know, they, like, they come and you know, they get to know each other probably over time, but then there are other groups that start them on their own, like you know, like like a group of people start their own club. So, but it's generally, from what I've witnessed, a, a mixture of friends and strangers. Um, and the one that I witnessed was folks from very different places in their lives, ranging from like teenagers to uh, folks who were <laughs> retired to uh, English as a second language who were doing it partly as language part of their language training. To um, saw at the same session a guy who was um, had run for like city councilman in Glendale as a under the Tea Party banner um, and so everybody was there and they all had very different needs that they were kind of felt like they were satisfying with it um, and it was fascinating to watch um, but it was highly structured if anybody if you've ever been to like a convention or a conference where there's like you know the keynote speaker and then they hand off the stage to the next person with a handshake that's basically the the sort of thing that's going on so there's one primary person who's well there's the president of the club who doesn't really do much except maybe kind of like start and end things but then there's the toast master and so everybody hears Toastmasters, and they always think toasts, you know, like cheers and stuff. But actually, has nothing really to do with that. It's the Toastmasters, this person who just basically hands off the mic, and it's like an MC who address, who brings people off and on, um, and introduces them by name and s tells the title of the of the thing that they're about to do, etc. And so there's a handful of things that happen. Um, usually at the top, there's usually, depending on the group, they usually decide this depending on, you know, there are ones that are more religious and ones that are more secular and so and ones that are more like nationalistic or whatever. And so they might start with the pledge or with some kind of prayer or with some kind of like um, meditation or with some kind of, whatchamacallit, I don't know. But the, uh, it's usually about three minutes and someone kind of leads off, you know, sets the tone for the day. Um, and, it, and each week, that is a different person who does this. And they, you know, before, before they come and do it, that person is assigned that task. They know probably maybe a week, maybe two weeks ahead of time that they are going to be the prayer leader of the day. And so they, you know, spend their week getting ready and, like, practicing their thing. 
And then there's usually someone who then comes and stands up next, like the Toastmaster comes and introduces the grammarian who delivers the word of the day, which is also kind of like, uh, anyway, sometimes it's word of the day and they encourage people to try and use this word during their talks. And if you do, you get like extra bonus points when you do your talks. And then they hand it off. The, uh, the Toastmaster will do some opening remarks and then introduce the people who are doing the main lectures. And there's usually um, three to four lectures that happen and they're usually somewhere between six and eight minutes. And there's usually someone in the back who has a little like clock or whatever who's the timekeeper the whole time and they, you know, they give them like a one minute notice and you can't go over and you can't go under, you have to do like six to eight <coughs> minutes. And they do like three or four of those. Each one of those speakers is assigned a, an evaluator. Um, so like if I were like one of the speakers, you might be my evaluator, you'd sit there and take notes, you know, then, some, then uh, you might come up and then you might be her evaluator and you take notes. Once we finish all of that, then we'd have this series of evaluators come up and you would come up and give like a, a two to three minute evaluation standing at the mic about me and then you would come up and give like a two to three minute so and I'll just get through and then also at the very end the grammarian comes back up they're also known as sometimes as the ah and um counter and they kind of talk about what they witnessed language wise throughout the day like whether people were doing like all the time or leaning too much or um, all sorts of you know extra extra lingual sorts of observations um, and then they usually kind of close the point of this format, though, is to kind of notice that they break, they break all of these different roles down. And each person who has a role um, has to get up and speak at some point and do that. Oh, there's, oh, oh, and then the table topics. Oh, sorry, table talk, topics is the awesomest part, actually. It's where this one person gets up and they go and they ask, they go around the room and it's about spontaneous lecture. And so you go around and you're like, so-and-so, like, you know, haha, I just like saw this person driving down the street and they were, and they cut me off and I just had to laugh at myself, you know, what a crazy world we live in. What do you think about craziness in the world? And then you have to, st like, I mean, that's literally like what they do. And you have to stand up and now you have to talk about craziness in the world for like two, like usually two to three or three to four minutes. And then he'll turn to someone else and it'll be a different one. Like, anyways, it's, it's, it's really great. I like it. Um, everybody's timed, et cetera. So, <laughs> It's highly structured, and so what I'm planning is not to do exactly this format. I, I think I want to mostly just focus on having a Toastmaster, having a grammarian, having a, someone deliver a pledge or, or some kind of prayer at the beginning, plus um, maybe three or four, maybe like three or four people to do like a, like a s six to eight minute speech in the middle. I don't think, I think we'll probably not do the evaluations. Um, and so I'm thinking that could be fun to do like a 60 to 70 minute artist run Toastmasters together. Would something like that be fun? Okay, cool. Yay, that was easy. Let me just show you a couple, I just want to give you a couple examples of things that were pretty, like some ways to kind of think about how other artists have experimented with the form of public speaking. Um, I mentioned this in the Welcome to Besht lecture, Antonin Artaud, um, there's actually the book, if there's a book in here somewhere of, uh, I, I can never pronounce her name, a Anais Nin, anyone know how to pronounce her name? Anais Nin, there's a section, there should be a bookmark in there where she talks about witnessing Antonin Artaud do a lecture on the plague, he has a piece, like if you look in one of his books, he has, it's called a lecture on the plague and you read it and it's, fine, it's kind of boring, but then he did, a, he did the lecture, he went, he was invited to go and deliver the lecture, and while he was doing it, he slowly started to pretend that he was dying of the plague, and by the end, he was just like gurgling on the ground, apparently, and, peop and, and he did it basically until everybody, except for a nice, you know, left. Um, so that was a very, like, kind of um, antagonistic, kind of avant-garde sort of approach to it. Um, there's another book in here, um, it's sitting there on the table by F.T. Marinetti, who is one of the futurists. Um, and he has this essay called The Pleasure of Being Booed, which is also what you might call another form of like avant-garde assholeism, uh, where it's this idea of just kind of trying to antagonize the audience into responding to you in some way. Um, and that you're not actually doing real artistic work unless the audience is actually engaging in a way that's 
that, you know, where you're actually challenging their senses. <laughs> Anyways, th those are, that's kind of that realm. Then there's also this realm of like um, Andrea Fraser, um, of kind of like role playing. Um, anyone familiar with Andrea Fraser's lectures at all? Anyone, anyone? She, um, this was I think in Philadelphia in the late 80s or early 90s or late 90s, I don't know when it was. But anyway, she was at a museum in Philadelphia and she went in and um, I think she, I think it was I think she was actually paid by the museum. I think she was like a visiting artist. I don't think she was just showing up, but she gave these artists. She was acting like a docent who was going around giving tours, and she did talk about the art apparently. But she also went through and like critiqued like the men's room and the cafeteria and the water fountain, and but used the same kind of like highfalutin language that she, that she that was used for the other things that was common of that kind of the rhetoric. Um, so in that case, she was like uh, role playing. Um, this is a friend of mine, Danielle Adair, that I also talked about. She did the, there's like this whole, you know, we talk about re-performance. Um, for some reason, I don't know why, like, this, like if you listen to the original version of this, which is by the Eat, Pray, Love author, and you listen to hers, it's just like, to me, it's just really boring. Like I'm not interested in the talk, but for some reason when Danielle did it and I heard about it, it just like, my, like my mind exploded. I was just, it just made me really happy to know that she had recited that lecture verbatim in a space, in an art space, um, where most people didn't realize what the source was. And people actually, apparently, according to a friend of ours, people actually went up to her afterwards and like thanked her. Is this so horrific? <laughs> no, I just saw the, some of the video. Yeah, public speaking is painful. Yeah. What is she doing? Yeah. So no, I. The only way I figured out was because someone. Was well, I didn't see it. Someone speech. told me. It was amazing. But yeah. I think most public speaking. I. I've seen. I saw a friend recently give a talk, and it was too much for me. But the thing was, her performance of it was this incredible sense of just self-assured, vaguely smug, uh, sage-like wisdom on creativity. She really inhabited that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Sound it was a pretty, conceptual, pretty con conceptually great. Yeah. Um, we we'll have to go in a sec. But a couple other things. So a bunch of these things that we get at it, like in the realm, in terms of. So you know, what I kind of want to think of is that in Toastmasters they have all of these modules for you to do. You know, it's like how to talk at a convention, how to talk to reporters, how to talk whatever. You kind of <laughs> study those. But if we look at what some other artists have done. Um, we can think of like, you know, there's like, you know, Andrea Fraser was doing this kind of role playing as like a docent and using that kind of language. So it wasn't necessarily her language, it was like someone else's language. Danielle Adair, the same thing. Um, uh, another fun writer in town, Teresa Carmody, writes the, is writing this book um, uh, called uh, Your Spiritual Suit of Armor by Catherine Anna. It's all from the perspective of like a, like a young teenage event, uh, girl who's an evangelical Christian. And it's not in a way, and she writes it in a way that is not like, like making fun of the character. It's it's like it just feels like you're actually reading a diary from a girl. And so it's this really odd kind of role play that's going on. Then you have the realm of like cut ups and unintelligibility. Um, there's a in the second issue of the Best Weekly. Um, there's an article by um, a speech by Veranda Moot. And it's basically, uh, if you read through it, it kind of makes sense the whole way through, but it's basically a cut up. Um, uh, Veranda Moot went through, uh, this, there's this website called uh, like the 100 best speeches of speech history or something like that. And basically went through and took one line from all 100 of them. Um, in the or and they appear in the order that she received them um, going to each website. And, um, and, fa and if you read through it, it makes it like kind of, kind of makes sense. So it's this thing that is not, like you, didn't, like you don't have to write your own speech, in other words, or you could assemble a speech. It doesn't have to necessarily make complete sense. Um, I saw a really great um, friend of mine graduated CalArts a number of years ago, and I saw his talk at the graduation thing, and he, uh, this guy, Matt Timmons, who's gonna do something 
in a few weeks. And um, he gave this talk that was a reading that was all sounded, it was like, or something like, but much better than that. It was basically sound poetry, but it sounded like someone talking on the news the whole time. And it was, and it was, it was incredible. Um, and it was towards the end of the day, and like there had been like a hundred other readers that day, and all of a sudden it was like the one thing that like was, was not just about understanding what the words were, so. Oh, so he just keeps talking, it's or? A, it's about, a, it's a written piece, and he does the exact thing for Baden, but it never kind of gets to a question. Oh, wow. That sounds fantastically <laughs> painful. <laughs> and then finally, I would also recommend checking out um, some of Cage's stuff when you look at his lectures. Um, he took previous lectures of his, plus other texts that he written, and used, you know, basically just flip coins to make decisions about how to perform them. Um, Who's the sound artist who also does like super amazing gibberish speech? He does a lot of looping pedals. Is he around today? Yeah, he's a contemporary artist. See him on YouTube. He's got uh, giant hair. Was he in town recently? Maybe. Was he with a German? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? A German he's, name? He, <laughs> his like mom is French, but he's black, and he does. He was like touring with Conan O'Brien. He does these incredible oh. like vocal things. Nobody knows what I'm talking. You guys should know who I'm talking about. I can remember who I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. I'll bring that in as a reference. Yeah. So maybe I know people have to go. So maybe what we'll do is like maybe about a week before, maybe I can send folks, or I don't know, maybe I can send folks kind of like a sign up sheet in the next week or so, and so people can start planning. And people, <laughs> like a Google Doc, and people can kind of just sign up for stuff. Does that sound good? Yeah? Okay. How many, and how many people we have in one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks so much, y'all. I appreciate it.